Welcome to your online lecture for chapters 15 and 16 entitled Medical Emergencies in Your Textbook. Um, when we talk about a medical emergency, what we're really referring to is a complaint from a patient that is not caused by a traumatic event. Um, there will be many calls that you encounter in your career that are medical in nature and not traumatic. Um, and so these, these calls may involve a patient who's complaining of abdominal pain, um, some form of altered mental status, and even simple complaints such as I just don't feel well or my stomach hurts. Um, just as you would with a traumatic patient, with a medical patient, your responsibility is still the same. You're still going to follow the same patient assessment plan. You're going to size up the scene to ensure um, your safety. And then we're going to follow the chain of command. We are going to then hand our patient off to advance out of hospital medical care. Um, and it's at that point in time that we end our treatment or our care for our patients end. So the purpose of this online lecture is just to familiarize you guys with some of the common medical emergencies that you might encounter in the emergency medical field. The, so the most common general medical emergency that you might encounter in the field is a patient who is suffering from a diabetic emergency. And so in order to understand the disease, the, the disease of diabetes, we really have to understand how the normal patient functions, right? And then once we can understand that, then we can kind of talk about what's abnormal or what's not functioning well in our diabetic patients. So we're looking at the left side of the screen. We're going to talk about our, our, diet, our normal patients first, right? Normally what happens um, when we eat food. So we, first of all, we eat food, um, that food then gets uh, digested or the digestion begins in the stom stomach. And then eventually what tends to happen is that food travels down into the small intestine. Um, and in the small intestine, this is the site where the food is being broken down into simple sugars. And so once the food is get is broken down into simple sugars, um, it can it can then enter into the into the bloodstream, right? And so the sugars that are broken down from the small intestine kind of enter the the, the bloodstream and that kind of stimulates the pancreas, so the pancreas here, to release insulin. And so we would say, well what is the major role of, of insulin and why does the pancreas release insulin when we have uh, sugar with sitting in our bloodstream? And the major role of insulin really is to uh, allow sugar to enter into into the bloodstream, right? And so sugar, and uh, once insulin is released, sugar is then allowed to enter into the bloodstream. Once it enters into, into the bloodstream, it is there that sugar can be delivered um, to, to our body cells, right? And then our body cells can now feed off of this sugar and they can survive. And so that's the normal patient. Um, that's the way things look normally when we eat food. On the opposite end of that spectrum is the diabetic patient, um, and something is malfunctioning, and typically it's an, it's an issue with, with the pancreas, but people with diabetes either do not make enough insulin, or for some reason, the insulin just doesn't do its job in terms of picking up um, the sugar and bringing it into to the bloodstream, um, and more specifically, into the cells. And so what happens is, in a diabetic patient, they eat the food, which is perfectly fine, the food travels in into the small intestine um, and it's broken down into simple sugars. However, the sugars then, um, for whatever reason, once the sugars are broken down, either the pancreas isn't stimulated to release insulin, okay, so it doesn't release insulin, or the opposite effect happens where the pancreas is stimulated um, to release insulin, but there isn't enough insulin released to bring the sugar from the blood stream into the, the, the body cells. And so what we have happening in a diabetic is the sugar just sits, it lies dormant in the bloodstream, and it never ever enters the body cells. Um, and so we have a situation where we don't, either we don't have enough sugar going into the, the body cells, or we have no sugar going into the bo body cells. Either way, the body cells begin to, to die off. Um, and they start to become very toxic. And so it's the sugars, because they cannot enter the cells, it, st it stays in the bloodstream, and then that sugar gets excreted um, in, the, in the urine instead of being utilized like it should. So there are two types of diabetes that a patient can, su can suffer from or be plagued by. Um, the first one is a type 1 diabetic, so someone who has been labeled a type 1 diabetic either produces little to no insulin so for whatever reason they are they are born with it um for their pancreas just does not function as well as it should and because it does not they produce no insulin or little insulin um and so these patients are the patients that are going to typically be taking shots of of insulin um on on an hourly basis or some shot regimen has been given to them by by a physician and then on the opposite end of the spectrum we have the type 2 diabetic and the type 2 diabetic 
um, is, is the patient whose cells do not respond to insulin anymore. And so you might, it might be that, in fact, your pancreas produces enough insulin the insulin sits in, in, in the bloodstream when the sugar is released, but for whatever reason, the insulin does not do its job to bring the uh, sugar into the bloodstream and more specifically um, into, into our body cells. Um, so it's not like they don't produce the insulin. The insulin's being produced. It's just that the cells um, do not respond. And so most type 2 diabetics are typically patients who um, tend to be obese in nature. Um, and so it's, it's a weight issue where the weight is actually what's causing uh, the type 2 diabetes. Okay, so uh, there are two different types. Type 1 where you're born with it, and you produce no, in the pancreas for whatever reason doesn't respond to, to the high levels of sugar and so you don't produce any um, insulin. Or you have a type 2 diabetic who, for whatever reason, the pancreas does uh, produce insulin and does release it, but the cells just do not respond to the insulin that's being released. Um, one you're born with, uh, you're type 1, and then type 2 typically you, you develop it over, over a lifespan. So two types of related emergencies are associated with diabetes, um, or hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. And we're going to talk about both of them independently. However, uh, you will not be required to distinguish um, one for, from the other because emergency care is the same for both conditions. So if we have a patient who is hypoglycemic, that's a patient who who has low blood sugar. Um, and this is typically as a result of um, taking either taking too much insulin or not eating enough sugar. If you have too much insulin within the bloodstream, then what happens is that insulin just takes all of, of the sugar out of the bloodstream and either delivers it into the cell and you get a case where there just isn't enough sugar um, within within the, the, the patient's blood. Um, this occurs less frequently than hyperglycemia, which we'll talk about on the other side. But it is it does happen suddenly and rapidly and it can take you it can just happen out of out of the blue um and it, it typically is a little bit more dramatic than your your hyperglycemia so people with diabetes can suffer from from low blood sugar it, it, it is possible to have that happen so what are some of the signs and symptoms well you can kind of see the signs and symptoms of, of hypoglycemia down here in, the, in this bottom in this bottom chart i'm not going to read them off to you but the number one of the number one signs and symptoms of someone um, in a hypoglycemic state would um would be the shaking um, and the fast heartbeat and specifically in our athletic population the weakness and the fatigue would also be of concern so what's the treatment um, you know if you have a, a situation where you have a low blood sugar then one of the best treatments is to give them some sort of sugar and so with my uh, diabetic patients what I tend to do is keep some type of candy bar or some type of soda that is non that is not a diet um, and those things tend to bring the blood sugar up relatively quickly so we said hypoglycemia is a situation where you have low blood sugar and then on the opposite end of that spectrum is hyperglycemia. Um, and then so we think about hyperglycemia, it's basically the case of too much blood in the sugar um, and too little insulin. So you don't have enough insulin to, re to remove the blood from the, the blood or the, to remove the sugar from the bloodstream and to bring it into the cells. And so that sugar just lies dormant in, in, in the blood and you get a hyperglycemic patient. Um, some common causes of hyperglycemia include infection, um, prolonged stress, uh, failure of your patient to take their insulin or to remember to take it, um, and then eating too much food that contains uh, um, sugar. And so we have to, with these patients, we have to re really look at what, what they're doing in their diet and whether or not they're actually utilizing their insulin like they should be if we have a patient who's constantly going into a hyperglycemic state. Um, and so we think about the signs and the symptoms of hyperglycemia it's very slow, unlike our hypoglycemia, where it's very rapid onset. Um, your patient's going to have a sweet, fruity smelling like breath. So when you get really close, you'll start to smell a really sweet. Their, their breath will smell, felt, smell really sweet. Um, your patient might be flushed and have warm skin and then rapid slash weak pulse. And so we can kind of look at these symptoms um, and we can kind of look at this chart below to help us determine what, what the symptoms are. Again, regardless of if they're in a hypo or hyperglycemic state, where really the treatment is going to be the same. So what is the treatment for someone who's suffering from a diabetic emergency, specifically hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia? Um, you know, what you really want to do is you want to proceed with emergency care as you would for a patient who has an altered mental status, right? So who's going either in and out of consciousness, 
or is slowly losing consciousness um, as the hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic state progresses. Um, if you suspect hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, you know what? The, the best thing to do is really just to call 911 right away um, and then to monitor the patient's uh, vitals, so their airway, their breathing, and um, their circulation. One big thing about a diabetic patient is you can always give them sugar. One rule of thumb in, in the field is that you cannot harm a hyperglycemic patient with sugar. Um, and the, uh, the other end of the spectrum is that you could save a life if a patient is hypoglycemic and you give them sugar. So when in doubt, give sugar. You can't make a hyperglycemic patient any worse than they already are. Um, you try not to give them anything by mouth if they're going in and out of consciousness. And this is obviously just to avoid um, the chances of, of vomiting or causing vomiting within our within our patient, right? We don't want them to, to do that. And so if we have a patient with altered mental status, we could assume that if they have altered mental status, they're not getting enough oxygen to the brain. Um, if they are hypo glycemic in nature they don't have enough blood in the sugar that eventually that patient's going to seize and so we want to lay that patient down and remove anything in the area that could potentially be harmful to our patients as they are seizing and then uh, obviously as first responders we want to avoid um, prevent our patient from going into shock so we can elevate the feet and or the legs above the heart to increase blood flow to the heart to facilitate the heart and its ability to pump or to circulate blood throughout the rest of the body. A more serious general medical um, emergency that you might encounter in the field is a stroke. And some people call a stroke a cerebrovascular accident or what we call a CVA. Um, and it's when a stroke is basically when an area of the brain um, becomes deprived of, of, of blood, right? And oxygen as well. And we're not getting blood to the brain. Then obviously we're not getting oxygen as well because oxygen and blood kind of flow together. Um, and this can occur as a result of a blood clot, which we would call a thrombus, um, which is when the blood clot blocks an artery, or it can occur um, as a result of um, when a blood clot or an artery actually bursts and you get, get what's called um, an aneurysm itself. So two different causes, either a clot is reducing blood flow and oxygen to the brain, or you get the the um, the opposite of that occurring where either the blood clot or the artery ruptures and you have an aneurysm. So some strokes may be preceded by what is called a transient ischemic attack or a TIA, which is basically a mini stroke. Um, and these mini strokes are often a warning sign of an Im impending larger stroke. So if you have a patient who uh, suffers from some type of temporary, um, let's say temporary lack of blood flow to the brain that eventually that's probably going to lead to a CVA or a cerebral vascular accident. And so we want to keep, um, keep track of the signs and symptoms so that if a patient who has a TIA, um, a five, five minutes ago, that eventually down the road, they're probably going to have um, a complete stroke or a complete CVA. Um, and so one of the most common causes of, of, of a stroke is atherosclerosis, which we talked about um, when we talked about the cardiovascular system. And so we can see that there are definitely other pathologies that really cause um, or lead to a patient suffering from a stroke. Now, some of them are just acute in nature, but most of them happen over time um, with the buildup of, of fatty deposits and um, plaque on, on the patient's arteries. So some signs and symptoms of a patient suffering from a stroke in the field, um, probably the most obvious would be altered mental status because there's no blood and oxygen going to the brain cells. Um, your patient is going to have uh, a drooping face and an inability to talk um, and then the inability to use one part of their body. And so we kind of use this acronym here called FAST. Um, where the F stands for face. Does the face look uneven? Is one side drooping or not? Um, the arm, we have our patients lift our arms up to about 90 degrees of flexion and have them hold it for 10 seconds. If one arm starts to fall down, then we know that that patient has had a stroke or suffered from a stroke on that side of the body. Um, and then S is the speech. Do they have slurred speech? inability to talk, inability to move their mouth. Um, so we look at speech. And then last but not least it is, is the time. If you observe any of these three signs and symptoms, then we want to call 911 right away. Remember, the problem with the cerebral vascular accident is the fact that this patient is not getting oxygenated blood to the brain. Remember, when the brain cells begin to die off, we have about six to 10 minutes before that patient suffers from irreversible brain death. So we have to take care of this patient right away. So what's our care? If we do recognize these signs and symptoms, we're calling 911 right away. 
We're going to be monitoring vital signs. So your airway, your breathing, um, and your circulation. One other vital sign um, that has been uh, hugely correlated or positively correlated to a person who's suffering from a cerebral vascular accident is blood pressure. Um, what has been reported is that about 50% of stroke patients have an elevated blood pressure during a stroke. So it might be wise just to go ahead and take their blood pressure to see if it's above the normal 120 um, over 80 um, in terms of within normal limits or in terms of normative values for patients. So there are many causes for seizure, seizures. Um, sometimes the cause is unknown, and, and you can tell by the, the lengthy list of causes. Um, and there probably are more that I don't have listed here. But some of the common causes could include anything like um, chronic medical conditions, epilepsy, hypoglycemia, poisoning, stroke, fever, infection, a head injury, uh, brain tumors, and obviously hypoxia. And then in some cases, complication with, with, with pregnancies can also lead to a seizure. So what's a seizure? Really, when we think about a seizure, if we were to define it, we would say that it's a result of, of a nervous system malfunction. Remember, we said that the nervous system is one of the most delicate human body systems that we have. Um, and so it's a malfunction of the nervous system. And these seizures can last anywhere from five minutes, or it could last even longer than that. It just depends on, on the seat, the type of seizure that our patient is having. Um, its symptoms can, it, they can range. And we'll talk about those kind of on, on the other side, on the other slide. During a seizure, what you will kind of witness or observe your patient doing is going through two different phases, uh, the, the tonic phase of the seizure and, the, and the, the clonic phase of the seizure. And so the tonic phase of the seizure is, is when your patient basically is in a state of continuous contraction. And so the tonic phase would really represent this phase here where you see the state of continuous contraction. Your muscles are just completely contracted and there's no relaxing. I mean, eventually once the seizure, once the patient is going, moving out of the seizure, the patient goes into the clonic phase of, of seizing, which is when you get this state of alternating contraction and relaxing. So you might get something where the patient looks like they're just in a complete state of contraction and then eventually they relax and then they go back into the, the contraction. The most dangerous portion or phase of, of the seizure truly is in the tonic phase because your muscles are just so contracted and they don't get a break. And so your patient might suffer from a um, from a muscle strain, and it is it is the tonic phase in which we would say that most patients become unresponsive, and typically most patients are extremely tired um, and sleep afterwards, and it's typically attributed to the tonic phase of of the seizure. So now we're going to talk about the four different phases um, of, of seizures that you might encounter and how to uh, help your patient or assist your patient who is suffering from a seizure in a, a seizure in an emergency situation. So as mentioned, um, there are four phases or four parts to, to the seizure. The first part of the, the seizure is going to be the aura phase, which is when the patient has a sign that they are getting ready to have a seizure. And typically that's some sort of unusual smell um, or a flash of light that they may see. I mean, it usually lasts about a second um, after they have the aurora. Aura, sorry, eventually they go into the tonic phase, which we've already talked about, and this is when all of the muscles are contracted. Um, and eventually the patient might let out a silent or a, a light scream. And then you get your clonic phase, uh, which is the third phase of the seizure, which is when you start to alternate between contraction and, and relaxation of the muscles. Um, and some at some point in time during the clonic phase, your patient may experience a loss of bladder, and so they may actually urinate during the seizure. And then last but not least is the post-ictal phase, which is when your patient gradually starts to regain responsiveness um, and they might be tired and or fatigued from the seizural activity. And so there are four phases and these are the four phases of seizing. So when we're in an emergency situation and we're dealing with a patient who is seizing, um, we have to be make sure that we provide proper treatment. And what does that treatment entail? Well, really, it's all about you as a first responder creating a safe area for the patient to see. So if there are chairs in the area, if there are weights in the area, if there are things in the area that the patient could potentially hit um, and cause more harm to them as they're seizing, you want to move those out of the area. You want to try to protect the patient's head. And that just might be you laying down your sweatshirt on your patient's head so the patient when they do start seizing if their head goes into extension and flexion they're not banging it on the ground big deal big rule of thumb for me is never try to stop their movement right and so I think that uh, when adrenaline starts going one of the things that we might be tempted to do is to kind of try to restrain the patient and when in fact we shouldn't do that we should allow them to seize and in restraining our patient we might actually increase um, their injury or the injury that occurred to the patient 
Um, so when do we call 911? We really want to call 911 um, when a patient has a, con a continuous seizure that lasts longer than a minute. Um, if they've had two or more uh, without a responsive pe uh, res without a response without responsive periods, um, and so we really want to see if we uh, determine whether or not we should call nine one one. And these are just a checklist of items that would allow you to say, okay, it's time for me to call nine one one and get advanced uh, emergency care to the scene. Um, and so next on our emer general em medical emergencies that we might encounter in the field would be an abdominal pain, and we've kind of talked about the abdomen being broken down into the four quadrants, right? And so we could palpate those four quadrants. Um, and within each of those four quadrants is housed several different internal organs. And we said, okay, each quadrant at least houses one uh, particular internal organ that's most commonly injured. And so we could draw the four quadrants out and list those four. So in the upper right, we have the liver. Um, in the lower right, we have the appendix. And in the upper left, we have the spleen. And in the lower left, we have the colon. And these are going to be the four most commonly injured internal organs in patients in an emergency situation. So what are the signs and symptoms of abdominal pain or an abdominal injury? The big deal is that our patient probably is going to be bleeding internally, especially if injury, if there's compromise or injury to the spleen and, and the liver, which are rich in blood. Um, but there are other signs and symptoms that could also be associated with the patient suffering from abdominal pain. And that list um, you see here, but there are definitely other signs and symptoms that a patient could present with. Um, we, your patient might complain of cramps, definitely some tenderness, um, and a rigid abdomen, which would be a sign and symptom that the patient is bleeding internally. If our patient is bleeding internally, uh, eventually we would assume that that patient would go into shock. Um, if they are vomiting and we have blood in the sputum, then we also suspect that the patient might be bleeding internally. Um, and so what what's one way to reduce abdominal pain in a patient who we suspect has some type of uh, general medical illness? And um, we can allow the patient to sit on, on their knees. Um, and so it's really interesting that if when you have your patient sit on their knees and flex their their uh, spine forward, it kind of reduces the amount of crap cramps or the uh, it reduces the pain that the patient feels when they are, are cramping. And so again, we allow that patient to sit on their knees and then flex the trunk forward. And that tends to relieve some of the pain in a patient with an abdominal injury. So now we're going to talk about uh, poisoning, and so I think it's important to note that although poisonings can occur in a variety of settings, the majority of poisoning emergencies that are you are going to encounter occur in the relative safety of, of the patient's home. Um, and so there are four routes of exposure, and we'll talk about those four wraps more uh, routes more specifically. But let's talk about first um, patient assessment and how we go about doing that in in a, in a poison emergency. So rule number one before we begin patient assessment is scene safety. Remember, we're always going to survey the scene for safety to make sure that it is safe for you to enter. Um, we're As a first responder, we're always going to put on our PPE or our personal protective equipment. And if we suspect a poisonous gas is the culprit, we never enter the scene, we're going to call 911 immediately. So after we've cleared the scene, after we put on our personal protective equipment, it is then and only then that we begin our patient assessment. And we, when we begin our patient assessment, we always begin with a vital assessment. Assessment, and the vital assessment is going to include assessment of the patient's airway, breathing, um, and circulation, as well as the patient's mental status, right? And so we would suspect that if a patient has been poisoned, that they probably would have altered mental status. Um, and it's interesting to note that the, the number one reported sign and symptom of a patient who has suffered from poisoning is altered mental status. So we always want to check the, pa the patient's levels of, of responsiveness and or consciousness. Um, one thing that we when, we, when we encounter a patient with poison, is that typically, depending on the route of administration, but most often poison will affect the central nervous system. So we really want to be looking at the patient's pupils, whether or not they're equal and reactive to light, um, whether or not they have excessive saliva um, and or foaming from the mouth, and then excessive tearing if the poisoning occurred you, um, from the tear ducts, and then the patient may become unresponsive. Again, that's kind of linked back to the altered mental status. Um, if your patient isn't breathing or if oxygen isn't getting to the brain, then our patient can suffer for, from seizures, and we've kind of already talked about uh, seizures activities in the slides that just preceded this one.
So what are you going to do if you suspect that a patient has been poisoned? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to contact EMS, so call 911, and or poison control. If you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the patient has been poisoned, then you really want to call poison control, the poison control center, because they are most equipped to deal with a, a victim that has been poisoned or has taken some, some sort of poison. Um, if you suspect poisoning uh, of the patient, you kind of want to try to... Uh, have the patient answer these few questions. Um, what You want to ask them what substance did they take or what substance was involved. You want to know how much of that substance was involved when they took it. Um, you want to know how long ago or when did the poisoning occur. And then last but not least, um, what has the patient or anyone else at the scene done to relieve any of the signs and symptoms associated with, with, the, with the poisoning. So as mentioned earlier, there are four routes of exposure or ways that a, a poison can enter the body. Um, the first route is ingestion, the second route is inhalation, the third route is absorption, and the fourth route is injection. And we're going to talk about each of those routes specifically. Um, the first route we're going to talk about is, is ingestion. So when we think about um, someone who has ingested a poison, what we're saying is that that poison has been introduced into the, dig the, the digest digestive tract by way of, of the mouth, right? Um, every year um, in the United States, there's over over 8 million reported ingested poisons, um, and then drugs such as aspirin and alcohol are probably among the top offender. So when we think about um, poisoning through ingestion, it's probably the number one common way that people tend to be poisoned. So part of uh, entering the scene of a person who, who has been suspected to be poisoned is really looking for things at the scene that might give you clues as to which poison, how much of the poison they've taken. And so we kind of have to be cognizant and be aware um, during scene safety that we're looking for any open pill boxes, any scattered pills, um, any empty alcohol bottles, any household cleaners that might be sitting out with the, with the lid off. So these are things that would give us some sort of inclination as to what type of poison our patient has taken. Um, another thing thing is that when a patient typically ingests poison, um, what has been frequently um, reported is that eventually that patient is going to vomit. And this is kind of a protective mechanism. Um, when you put something poisonous within the body, the body wants to, to vomit to get the poison out of the system as quickly as possible. And so they, we do that using, using vomit as a mechanism. So we're going to be, um, so when we encounter a patient, who we potentially think has ingested a poison, we also want to make sure that the patient, if they've already vomited, when we get to the scene, that they don't have an airway obstruction. Remember, we're going to put that patient in the recovery position, um, and in the recovery position, the head is in a gravity-dependent position, which facilitates the removal of vomit from our patient's uh, mouth and reduces their chances of choking, right? So how do we care for someone that has ingested a poison? The first thing we want to know is we want to be able to observe the signs and symptoms of ingested poison. And there are several different depending on the type of poison. But typically, if it's a corrosive poison, then we're looking at burns around the mouth, um, weird, odd smelling breath, um, nauseousness, vomiting, which is highly correlated with ingested poison, um, abdominal pain, and or diarrhea. So diarrhea and vomiting are two awesome ways to excrete something from, from the body. Um, and so these are the signs and symptoms that we would encounter. Um, you can use activated charcoal to absorb some of the the, um, the poison. And so activated charcoal is an over-the-counter agent um, that can be administered or given to the patient. The patient drinks this substance and the activated charcoal pretty much acts like bread. When you eat bread, the bread kind of soaks up any of the fluids within the body. The same thing occurs with the activated charcoal. It's specifically ingested in order with a goal to absorb the majority Majority of, of the poison. Um, you can also use uh, water or, or milk um, to dilute the poison. So have your patient flush your patient out by having them drink as much water as you can. Again, by drinking water, what we're essentially doing is we're going to basically um, have that patient excrete the poison uh, via urination. And then last but not least, we want to call 911 or the poison control center um, before diluting the poison um, and always follow your local uh, protocol when you can, when in doubt. Another route of exposure to poison is, is inhalation. And so when we think about inhalation, we could say, well, not to forget that many poisonous gases are colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Um, and so you may not know you are in danger as a first responder until it's too late. So you really always want to look out for hazardous materials, um, pay constant att attention to the nature of the incident um, and the dangers that it might contain. And then obviously, first and foremost, protect yourselves 
uh, yourself and keep other uh, bystanders away from the scene when you suspect that uh, poisoning has occurred uh, via inhalation, the inhalation route. And so when we, how do we define um, inhalation? Well, it's poison in a gaseous or aerosol form um, that is breathed into the body. And um, breathing, it could be through both the, ma the oral air, the oral um or, or the oral airway or the nasal airway, right? We can get um, gaseous substances into either of those anatomical structures. Um, and so some examples that I've included um, would be inhaling gas such as carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide. Um, it could be something uh, like sniffing, like hairspray can, any of those types of things where you're inhaling the, the poison into the, um, the oral and nasal cavities. So some things to look for when entering the scene. I think number one, the first thing that you want to look for when entering the scene is to remember that gas is colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Therefore, it poses a potential danger to you as a first responder. You want to look out for hazardous materials. There will be signs posted, placards posted on trucks, but in the house there might be signs on, on the bottles or the aerosol um, spray cans. So you want to look for clues, things that would give you an idea of how your patient was poisoned. Um, you want to pay constant attention attention to the nature of the incident and then dangers that it that it may contain um, and then we would say that you'd want obviously want to protect yourself as well as others keep them away from the scene if at all possible and then last but not least again if you suspect poison uh, gas such as carbon dioxide or monoxide you want to call uh, EMS right away so that they can bring in special teams to help clear out uh, the poisonous substance from the emergency situation. So special teams will be called um, in an effort to clear the environment of any poisonous gas. So your care for a patient who has inhaled the poison versus ingested the poison is, is a lot different. And, and here's why. Um, with an inhaled poison, you really want to give special attention to the airway. Um, when you inhale a poison, um, typically that, that inhalation occurs again via the nose or the mouth. And the airway starts to shut down relatively quickly in a patient who has inhaled a poison. Um, and so once you're in a safe location, open the airway and, and inspect both the mouth and the nose. Because if you don't inspect both the mouth and the nose, um, then you, you might have a situation where the airway begins to shut down completely um, and you're not, your patient isn't getting enough oxygen um, to, to the brain cells and the heart cells. You want to look for uh, burns and or singed hair. Um, why would that be? You might say because that's a sign and a symptom that a patient has inhaled, let's say, a corrosive substance. Um, and then when we think about the signs and symptoms that might be associated with uh, in a person who has inhaled a poison, um, you know, they're going to have difficulty breathing if the poison has gone into the nasal cavity. Definitely chest pain, some coughing if that poison has been inhaled uh, through the uh, oral cavity. You might get hoarseness, which is affecting the pharynx um, portion of your, your respiratory pathway. Some burning sensation in the throat. Uh, definitely some dizziness, uh, headache if the poison has been sniffed through the oral or through the nasal airway. Your patient might have a seizure um, and definitely will become unresponsive if their respiratory system is affected in any way. So one specific inhaled poison that we're going to spend some time on because it's most common in the emergency medical field is um, inhalation of, of carbon monoxide. And when we think about carbon monoxide, it's a poisonous gas that is really lethal. Um, kerosene heaters, your hot water heaters, your car exhaust fumes are some of the most common sources of um, carbon monoxide exposure. Um, so we have to be particularly alert to carbon monoxide poisoning if several members of a household have the same signs and symptoms. Um, and so also suspect it if they say um, that they are only sick when they are in a certain location. So like if they're in the laundry room or if they're in the car, um, these would be signs and symptoms potentially that our patient might be suffering from carbon monoxide um, poisoning. And so what are the signs and symptoms associated with this specific uh, pathology of inhaling carbon monoxide? Well, those signs and symptoms could include but are not limited to anything such as a throbbing headache um, from the inhalation. Again, vomiting, confusion, uh, diminished vision is a uh, differential when we compare it to other inhaled poisonings, paleness, uh, cherry or red skin appearance, which is a late sign uh, when the exposure has just been prolonged. So it's a late sign of uh, prolonged exposure to carbon monoxide. And so any patient with carbon monoxide poisoning needs medical care um, immediately. And, and that medical care will consist of several different treatments. And we'll talk about those on the next slide. So to care for someone who has um, inhaled some type of poison, the big thing to do is when it is safe to do so, we're quickly going to remove the patient from the source or the exposure 
um, to, to the poison. And then next, what we want to do is really administer oxygen at about 10 to 15 liters per minute via either a non-rebreather mask and or a bag valve mask as well. We could use either one of those because those two are, um, oxygen administration devices really are going to deliver the highest percent concentration of oxygen to our patient. Um, once we've got the oxygen set up, the next thing that we want to do is we want to uh, uh, then proceed like we would for any patient with, with an altered mental state status, which would be to, again, assess the vitals, so your airway, breathing, and circulation. And then last but not least, we can't forget to verify that an ambulance is, is en route. Um, we want to make sure that they're en route because if they're not, um, and this is a medical emergency, the, the longer they're delayed, the, the less chance we have of our patient surviving from an inhaled poison. Um, and so sometimes we might want to consider like a helicopter evacuation if that would be quicker. Now, a note um, is that, you know, all patients who are exposed to carbon monoxide need medical care. Again, it's not just, okay, they've been exposed for five minutes, they're okay. Even if the, the exposure is minimal, we still want them to go to the emergency room to see if there are any long-term effects from that exposure. So again, even if it's a, a limited amount of exposure, we still want them to get checked out by a physician. So the third route of exposure to a poison is, is absorption. And when we think about something that's absorbed, it's typically when a poison enters the body by way of contact with the skin. Remember, we talked about the integumentary system um, with the epidermis and the dermal layer. So the poison basically um, invades the dead cells that are lying on the skin. It goes through the epidermal layer and down into the dermal layer. Um, and then it gets absorbed into the circulatory system where it's circulated um, and it wreaks havoc. And so we can, some of the examples of absorb. Uh, poisons are ones that we would see, um, you know, on a hike, right? And so we think about your poison oaks, your sumanac, uh, your poison ivies, right? These are all uh, poisons that can be absorbed and that we do come in contact with um, in California or within the United States in general. And so how do we care for these patients? Because this is probably going to be the second most common type of poison that we're going to encounter in an emergency situation. So how do we care for these patients? The first thing is that we have to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms um, of an, absor an absorbed poison exposure. So the signs and symptoms um, would be history of exposure. So your hikers who are constantly going hiking and getting red rashes and, and being uh, exposed to poison ivy or poison oak. Um, you could see dry liquid powder on the skin. You could look at burns, itching, irritation, redness, rash, blisters, all of the things that would indicate that the patient has in some way irritated that epidermal layer of, of the skin. And so once we've observed the signs and symptoms and we're able to recognize that a person has, has been exposed to some type of uh, poison that has been ex absorbed into the, into the skin, what we want to do is we want to really remove the exposure. Um, and so so we want to remove the clothing that clothing that the, the poison came into contact with, or we want to, um, if it's if it's a dried powder on the patient's skin, then we want to wipe that powder away, um, and then we're going to clean the skin or brush it off if it is dry. And so we never ever want to put water on a dry. Um, a dried poison because when it becomes wet, it becomes activated. So note to self, never put water on something that is dry. Just go ahead and brush it off if you encounter it. Um, after everything's been removed, what we want to do is flood the area with lots of water. So we're talking gushing water over the area so much so that it wouldn't cause activation. It would actually cause the removal of the poisonous agent. Um, and we're going to continue to flush this area until EMS arrives. And so that might be five to eight minutes, depending on the average response time of your, your ambulance crew to emergency situations. In the meantime, while we're waiting for EMS to arrive, what we want to do is continue to model, monitor the vitals of, of your patient. If your patient goes into seizures and shocks, then obviously we know how to care for them. But it's typically un, uncommon. Um, with patients who have some type of absorption po uh, poison exposure. And then last but not least, if a patient uh, suffers from poisoning, um, absorption poison that occurs through the eyes, we would say, you know, the eyes are very vulnerable. Um, and if they are effective, we're going to flush them out. Um, and typically we flush them out either with the saline solution um, or with water if that's all we have available. The big deal with flushing out an eye is we always might want to make sure that the exposed eye is always pointing down towards the ground. Um, when we're flushing. If we flush the eye and the poison eye is on top, what tends to happen is the poison will flow out of that eye into the other. And now we have not only one poisoned eye, but two.
the last route of transmission um, in terms of poison is, is injection. And so we can think of something being injected. It means that the, the poison enters the body by way of an object that pierces the skin. Now, that, that, that actual uh, piercing could occur from, by way of a hypodermic needle, but it can also occur by way of a, a bite and or a sting from an insect, spider, and or snake. Um, and so we see these examples listed below and we can see them um, in, in the figures below as well. And so when we look here, we see you know your snakes, um, your bees, and your hypodermic needles as probably the three most common types of or modes of injection poisoning um, within, the, within the United States. So how do we care for someone who has is suffering from poison reaction due to injection? Um, if it's an illegal drug, you never want to uh, touch the needle or recap the needle because those those needles, if it's associated with um, heavy drug use, may have diseases and you don't want those diseases transferred to you. Um, you. You can have serious allergic reactions that can occur with bug bites and so we can get anaphylactic shock. Um, one rule of thumb has been to give our patients um, Benadryl, which Benadryl is really, really good at reducing severe allergic reactions. Take the caps of a Benadryl, break it in half, and dump it underneath their tongue, um, and that will tend to reduce the allergic reaction that the patient might have. If you have a bee sting, you want to be careful um, with, with the stingers, because if you break the stinger off and it doesn't come come out completely, then that stinger can still deliver poison into your patient. So you have to be careful when you're removing a stinger if you decide to remove one. If your patient goes into anaphylactic shock, um, you either you call 911, but you might have an epinephrine pin or an EpiPen, and if not, again, Benadryl does the trick. And then you want to call EMS right away if, if you can. Um, the reason you want to do that is out of fear that the patient might actually die from anaphylactic shock. So we've talked about the four different forms or exposures to, to poison, um, and we can kind of end with this, and is that when we, have, when we have a patient who we suspect is suffering from some type of poisoning, we really do not want to call 911. We really want to call the Poison Control Center. Um, and so I think it's important for us to have that number, and it's, it's right here. I've given it to you uh, because they are the people that are, are capable of caring for victims of, of poison. So if you're going to call 911, eventually the 911 operator is going to call the Poison Control Center. So maybe you can just skip that call to 911 and call the poison control center uh, directly. If you have a patient who has ingested um, or uh, ingested poisoning, then we want to give them out activated charcoal as soon as possible. Um, and again, that activated charcoal will basically start to absorb the uh, ingested poisoning. And then all, water is always good um, when we're dealing with a dry uh, poison that is on the skin. Remember, we want to uh, brush it off first and then just flush that area um, with with water. If we're dealing with an ingested poison or an inhaled poison, water is always good to dilute the acid um, and make them more alkalinic in nature. And so this kind of concludes uh, your lecture for, for chapter 15, which really deals with general medical emergencies um, and also um, poisoning emergencies as well. Thank you for your attention. Um, the lecture for chapter 16 will be posted um, by the end of the day. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in our next class session.